All right, I think we got it. <laughs> Good afternoon, everybody. <laughs> My name is Kimmy McBurney with Shoe Spark Society, your host for the week. And I have Mary Lotterla. Close, Letterly. Letterly. Okay. I was like, I'm going to butcher it. I'm sure everyone does that. Um, with us today, welcome. Thank you so much for joining us. And I think I prepped you, but my favorite question to get it kicked off to get some of your background, birth to real estate in five minutes or less. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Born and raised in Western North Carolina. Um, yeah. Spent, um, went to, you know, went to high school here, went to college at UT in Knoxville studied athletic training and exercise science, worked in orthopedics and sports medicine here in Western North Carolina for over 20 years and decided I needed a break. My cousin sold luxury real estate in Florida, had an opportunity to go down there. So left healthcare and moved to Florida, um, literally started over from scratch, um, helped her. She was doing about 18 million on her own. So when I came in, we um, I changed all of her marketing, all of her operational processes. And in three years, we went from 18 million to 78 million with just the two of us. Um, so it was, you know, part of that was just the market shifting, but a large part of that was just the way that we represented ourselves and our workflows. Um, and then was homesick and I was ready to come back home to the mountains. Um, I was ready to, honestly, I was ready to be able to swim in water and not be eaten by a shark or a gator. <laughs> Fair. Fair. <laughs> so, um, I moved back home um, this past summer and um, is practicing real estate here. But in the course of this journey, I had a lot of people reaching out to me, asking me how we um, did so much business in such a short amount of time. So that really kind of created this niche market for me where I realized a lot of people were really struggling with what direction to go to and how do they get their business running as productively as possible. Um, and so that kind of created my, my business, which is Breakaway Business Ventures. And I help a lot of clients, realtors, financial advisors, insurance agents, uh, physical therapists across the country, um, really build out their strategic business plans and marketing plans um, to really help them improve their productivity and grow their sales. All right, I have so many questions. I need to take notes. <laughs> okay, so when did you first get your real estate license? Uh, four years, four and a half years ago. Four and a half, so what year was that? 2019, early yeah, 2019. You, you came right before the, right before the madness. So, and you're licensed in Florida and North Carolina, I assume? Yes, yes. Okay. Um, and yeah, so you, you, this 18, I think you said to 78 million, that was like 2020, 2021? Yes. Um, yeah. It was between... 2019 because she was doing like I said she was doing about 18 million on her own and the first year I started with her in April and by the end of that year we had done over 30 million that's so crazy so obviously it was a crazy market but speaking to those years specifically what did you guys personally employ to kind of boost your business yeah so we really started thinking about the business as a business and not just a, a, a an agent that is buying and selling property. So we really kind of focused on what were our strategic business priorities? What did we want the business to look like? What were we trying to achieve? Um, so once we had those objectives, priorities laid out, then we could focus on how do we actually deliver that and reach those goals. So um, we started out by re doing a complete rebrand. Um, it was no longer focused on just the agent. It was really, the brand was trying to target a key audience. Um, she was in the luxury market. So we rebranded using more luxury themes, luxury fonts, luxury messaging, because messaging to a luxury client is very different than a non-luxury client. Um, we know that she, she really wanted to stay focusing on listings. So again, that messaging is very different. So we rebranded everything. Then we said, okay, how are we going to be prepared for the influx of clients? So we got all of our processes in place, spent a lot of time on our workflows and automating where we could, um, bringing in new tools to help us get um, more productive. Um, but then we really honed in on our marketing and that was key. Um, I think with a lot of agents or a lot of professionals in general, they have, I feel like their approach is kind of spray and pray. You spray the market and pray something sticks. <laughs> mm -hmm. 
and we we didn't want to do that. We wanted to be very intentional and strategic with who we worked with, how we worked with them, and how we were going to actually implement that. So that was something we spent a lot of time on. We knew that we wanted to maintain a business that was at least 60 to 40% listings to buyers. And that is a completely different strategy when you're carrying more listings than you are buyers. So we really focused on identifying our target audience, price point, neighborhood, et cetera, and then flush that out in more detail to really hone in on our, on our marketing plan and make it very strategic. Okay. And are you still involved with her or is she still a solo agent? What's going on with the business now that you're here? Yep. She's a solo. Um, she's a, she brought on two additional, um, agents who also have a son. So they grew from, you know, the two of us to a team of, uh, one, two, three, four now. And she wanted to take a step back because she, she was just kind of bored and didn't want to, didn't want to have to work as much. So she brought on (laughs) these two and they've essentially partnered up to run their business together and share in the, share in the profits and expenses and everything. Yeah, that makes sense. I think that's all of our goal, right? To- it is all of our goal. <laughs> exactly right. Yeah. Uh, okay. So I know you and I talked about this when we prepped. Like, I want to kind of go through your process almost with like a test case. Yep. I don't necessarily have a great test case, but let's say, okay, say Susie Q is a realtor. Yep. I think a lot of our demographic in our group of She Sparks is like new ish. So two to two to five years. So exactly. We all came in during this awesome market or, you know, great market. 2020, 2021, now it's slowing down or it's changing, yep. shifting. <laughs> <laughs> right. um, so say they come to you and they just say, hey, my business is stalled out. I had all these great referrals and it was just business was flying at me. What do I do? Yep. Great. Good question. It's, uh, it's a question a lot, a lot of people are facing, <laughs> you know, and I think, I think that's where you, the very first thing you have to do is figure out what do you want your business to look like? And I can even say, take a step back and say, and look at your business and say, are you even set up as a business? Are you running yourself as a business? I, f- I think a lot of agents just go into it and they don't set themselves up as an LLC. They don't get their, ta- you know, they're not being taxed as an S4. Um, they are, you know, they don't use an accountant. They are not even set up as a business. So I think before you do anything as an agent, you need to really look at your business plan and make sure that you're doing everything you can to, to set yourself up as a business. Once you've done that, I think it helps your mind shift, your, your, your mind shift to you are running a company and you're, and it helps you to identify your goals. You know, what are your goals? Are you going to, and every agent is different. I think most people are like, well, I want to sell as many homes as, and as much money and make as much money as pro, as possible. Well, that's all fine and good, but there's lots of ways to make money in real estate. Do you want to make money through investments? Do you want to make money through actually, you know, buying and selling homes for clients? Um, You know, do you want to make money? You can make a ton of money, but if you're also spending a lot of money, you're actually not profitable or you're not as profitable. So for agents that are saying, I, what do I do next? I always tell them, number one is look at how your business is set up and, and, start following best practices for that. Talk to an accountant, talk to a lawyer, get yourself set up the correct way. Number two, really look at- Real quick, I have a plug. Yep. We interviewed an accountant, a CPA. She's actually here in Asheville, Alicia Sis Morris. So I referenced earlier, we have a YouTube channel, just She Spark Society. Try and find her. And she talked all about best practices for if you should do LLC, S Corp, Corporation, how you should be doing your taxes, which QuickBook version to use and which not. So if anyone's watching this and you want to start on step one, check that video out. Okay, so step Excellent. one, Very we good. Did it. we've done it all kosher yep. and now we're moving on to step two. Excellent. <laughs> so step two is what are identifying your goals? What are your actual goals and objectives? And the way I approach it is I take, I'm very strategic and intentional, right? I've said that multiple times. I'm going to keep saying that. I'm looking at what are my five-year objectives, my priorities, what do I want to do? And one of those is achieve targeted growth. Um, I want to grow as much as I possibly can. I don't know, 
you know, obviously I'm going to be limited by how well the market's doing, et cetera. But if my five-year plan is to achieve targeted growth, then I can at least break that down into smaller pieces. I think that's where too, people get overwhelmed by all the things coming at them, by what they can do. Um, just break it down into smaller pieces. So for an agent, if you're kind of newish, figure out what you want to do and what growth looks like to you. Does growth mean adding more agents? Does growth mean selling more homes in terms of representing a seller? Does it mean helping buyers? Like what are you, what's your end game here? What are you trying to achieve? And who is your target audience? So for example, I have just relocated from Florida to North Carolina. I am starting my business over from scratch. Um, so for me, I think I can use myself as a, t as a test case. I live in the, in the Fairview area and I want to, I know that I want to represent, um, luxury listings. That's what I was doing in Florida. So I want my book of business to be a minimum of 60 to 40 listings to buyers. Um, to me, that's a more profitable model for, and I want to be more profitable. I don't want to make more money. I want to make I want my net profit to grow, right? So that includes growing revenue and decreasing expenses if, if possible, right? That's what you get with, with net profit. So I can go in a lot of different ways with this. So from a marketing perspective, now that I know a little bit about which direction I'm going, I need to clean that up. So luxury listings, well, I need to identify what is that price point? Where are those neighborhoods? And then what does the makeup, what does a seller in that demographic actually look like? You know, what is their income? What are their buying behaviors? Um, what are their goals in general? Are they, when they sell a house, are they typically upsizing? Are they downsizing? Do they have children? Where, what point, where are they in their, in their life right now? Knowing that information will help me to determine what kind of a marketing plan I'm gonna put into place. The messaging and the content and the way in which I communicate with them is gonna be very, very different compared to a first time, you know, a, a first time home buyer or somebody that this is, they've owned their first house for five years and they don't have children, but they're thinking about it and they wanna upsize. That, those communications are very different. And I wanna point out too that sales and marketing is very different. I think a lot of people get those two buckets confused. When I think of marketing, I think of building relationships and building awareness that's going, and those efforts are going to get me to the appointment or get me to the table. Whereas sales, those strategies are very different. And sales comes into place when you're actually at the table and you're closing the deal. So I don't want to confuse those. And I think that's part of when you're looking at this as an agent, you need to differentiate between marketing strategies and sales strategies. What you do leading up to the appointment is very different than what you do at the appointment and closing the deal. Genius. Okay. So to market is to what gets them to the listing appointment. Sales is what closes the listing appointment. That's exactly right. Yep. I love it. Well, so I'm going to kind of ask you because you offered yourself as an example, if you don't mind sharing a little bit of your playbook, because I know, I know most of the agents work in this area. Corey also lives in Fairview, but she's not quite, she doesn't quite target luxury. I've seen so, her signs around. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's funny, we had a newer agent, Molly, and Molly's like, I can't work in Fairview. Corey owns Fairview. I was like, no one owns anywhere. <laughs> right, right. Exactly. Okay. So you're, yeah, like you said, you're here. So what, what have you done? And like, what is your preliminary? Like, here's my course of action. Here's how I'm going to accomplish it. Yep. yep. Um, couple things. One, do not try to employ 10 different strategies or tactics to help you be successful. Pick one or two and actually do them. Like you can have 10 strategies, but if you only do one of them, or if you only do, you know, five of them half-assed, you're still not going to be successful. So don't lose, don't get caught up in, oh, I've got to check these 10 boxes to be successful. Pick a strategy that works for you. Everybody is talking about, oh, you got to do, you got to do videos, you got to do social media, et cetera. 
guess what? I sold 150 homes um, and over 90 million in the last two years. And I didn't do a single video of myself. Didn't. I had, I had other strategies that worked for me and for that market. My clientele was not, was not influenced by videos. So it did not work for my clientele. That might be different here. So one of the things that I have found to be very successful is farming. If you are a newer agent, you need to have a farm is my suggestion. So when you're looking at farming is basically targeting a neighborhood or neighborhoods or properties and consistently building brand awareness and relationships with the people that live and, and work in those neighborhoods. So you could farm any neighborhood that you want. However, you should farm intentionally. The industry standard for real estate, if you're going after a farm, is to find a farm with a minimum of a 6% turnover ratio, meaning at least 6% of the homes in that farm are selling every year. You want a minimum of 6% and you want a farm that has um, that no agent represents more than 30% market share in that neighborhood. So if you're going after a farm and it has a 2% turnover ratio, that tells you that there's not a lot of homes that are selling in there. So you could be spending a lot of money to market to that neighborhood for a very low return on investment. Same thing. If you have a neighborhood that has an agent that has at least 30%, 40 or 50% market share for listings, not necessarily buyers, for listings, it's going to be a lot more difficult to compete against that agent. It doesn't mean it's not possible. It just means your strategy is going to be different and it might take longer to overcome and to create competition for, for that agent. Um, same thing, you need to have enough homes in a, in a farm for it to be successful. So obviously it costs money to farm, whether it's through print or digital marketing, but if you are smart about it, you can save money and still get a good return on investment, but your farm should be, you should aim for a farm size of 500 properties. That doesn't mean starting out, you need to start at 500. What I would do is if you don't have a huge budget, start out with what you're comfortable with, 100 homes, 50 homes. The key is you need to be, make sure that they're, you know, if you're going to start with a smaller farm, I would start with a higher um, turnover ratio, 10 or 10 to 15% with a smaller farm, just because you'll hopefully get a quicker return on investment. Any money you make from those sales you need to set aside a portion to reinvest in your farming activities. I think a lot of agents fail to do that. They get revenue, they get these commission checks, and it goes straight into their pocket. And they, if they're smart, they'll keep out 25% for taxes. They need to set aside, a, you know, an X percent for their, their savings account or their um, SEP plan, you know, their um, uh, retirement account but then they need to also set aside a certain percent to reinvest in your business and your marketing activities. If you've got a budget to support 50 homes, that first commission check, you need to, you need to set aside enough to do another 50 homes and grow your farm to the point that you've got about 500 properties that you're marketing to. Um, that, that would be my recommendation. And it does not have to be a, close to where you live, but it's ideal. You don't have to live and work in that neighborhood, but you also don't want to be driving an hour for a farm. Um, but this is farming. genius. By the way, if you want Corey's address, I'll let you, I'll DM you it because she's got that <laughs> neighborhood locked down. You probably find that she's, and she's worked really, 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 really hard for sure, it. So sure. This is genius because I think, yeah, people go after shiny objects and they just, send out postcards one, Sarah. And I love that you, and I want to harp on it, that you said, pick one thing. Yep. And I think farming is really smart, but yeah, exactly. YouTube, great. Events, great. Farming, great. But like pick one thing. It's so easy to be like, I'm going to employ 10 things because I have no idea what's going to work. So right, I love right. the, 
farming and we had a really good um a representative she works for a, a mailer company but she's also a realtor so again she's on our youtube channel she had an awesome one so if you want to do mailers and like you were saying like set a budget set a goal and I love that you're checking these statistics like you're not just picking some random neighborhood because it sounds cool because like right. you said an agent could have that locked down like don't yeah. even try um so but well, you also want to go after the low-hanging fruit it doesn't mean you can't go after that neighborhood but if there's another neighborhood that's easier to get market share in do that first yeah. build build up your you know build up your listings and your reputation then go after that neighborhood yeah and I think what's important too, we learned in the mailers, she said, if you want to do a mailer campaign specifically, you work in a specific neighborhood for an entire year. Like yes. you have to commit to a serious budget, like, and don't just mail them out once, you know, oh, I just yep. sold a house. I'm going to do a just sold card. You're wasting your money. Like you've got to target a neighborhood. Yes. And I also love that you're quantifying it, um, you know, by percentages of homes and goals for a number, like so actionable. So I'm it is well, and I, and I also think that data <laughs> drives good decision making. If you're not using data to make business decisions, you're going to get frustrated. You're going to spend more money than you should, and you're ultimately either not going to reach your goal or it's going to take a lot longer and cost a lot more money. So again, just using using data available and setting a threshold. You don't have to do it at 6% turnover ratio. That's the industry standard. If there's a neighborhood that the average price point is 2 million, but only a 3% turnover, you could kind of say, well, I could kind of justify that because it's a higher price point. So if I can sell one home, I'm going to break even or make money on the outlay of cost. 6% is a guideline. Um, that being said too, in farms, if you, especially if you have an actual neighborhood, not just properties in a zip code, if you have an actual neighborhood, do a deep dive of that neighborhood. If there's a street that homes back up to a main road and don't sell well, don't market to those homes. <laughs> you don't have to market to all of the homes in that particular neighborhood. Be strategic, be intentional, pick the ones that are most likely to sell well and not sit on the market. Same thing when you're choosing a neighborhood, choose the price point. Don't, you know, if, if there's a 10% turnover ratio in a neighborhood, but it's at a $200,000 price point, do you really want to spend your efforts there if your end goal is to work luxury listings? Probably not. Um, that's not the best use of your money or your time. Um, when it comes to marketing though, you've got, if you've identified a farm, you can, market to them in several different ways. You don't have to just do print mailers. You could do a social media campaign, whether it's you know paid advertisements, um, you can do videos, you can target those neighborhoods, those zip codes, those properties via a social media campaign. You can do a combination of that instead of, you know, your goal is to get in front of those people at least once a month minimum. And you can do that if you're, especially if your budget is not a big budget, you could do print mailers once every two to three months and digital advertisements on a, you know, two, two times a month or once a month in between so that you're still targeting them. You're just targeting them in a different way. Um, you know, same thing if you're, if you've got a farm, if you live in, in that neighborhood or close by, consider other ways that don't cost money to target them. Get with your local um, lender and maybe host a community event in, a, in the local community center and talk to that, you know, just invite everybody, send out an invite, um, invite everybody and talk about, you know, different loan products that are available or, you know, what, it, what it's like to refinance. Provide something of value and invite them to an in-person event. That might be a different way to target them. Um, but you're still targeting that farm. At the end of the day, you're targeting the same group of people in a different way. Yeah, I feel like people are so afraid to do that, like a particular neighborhood, because they feel like they pigeonhole themselves. But yep. like you said, I mean, it's such a concentrated effort, like it's going to pay off. So yeah, I like your suggestions. And just to kind of reiterate, so like you said, mailers, obviously, that's pretty self-explanatory. Yep. Facebook groups, like you said, are are free, especially if it's 
you know, Oakwood Farms or whatever, you know, like an actual neighborhood or a subdivision, like you can use yep. that. Um, I know a lot of people do that starting out because it's free. Facebook groups are free and they're, yep. they're a literal gold mine. Um, yeah. So let's brainstorm what other, I mean, and then from Facebook, you can do targeted ads, stuff like that. I mean, door knocking, if it's, especially if you're only starting out with 50 houses, like door knocking is pretty um, successful. Yep. So, yeah. I mean, I guess you could probably get the phone numbers too and, and cold call. Any other, any other farming strategies that come to mind? Um, I like the Facebook group one or just community group idea. Um, I play ice hockey. So one of the things that I've done is I, I manage and created the Facebook groups for the local ice hockey organizations here. And I don't talk real estate. I talk about ice hockey and I try to build the community and recruit people to come and play. And, and I, you know, share schedules. If somebody posts, Hey, I've got equipment for sale. I am sharing that information. Um, I don't talk real estate. However, when somebody has a real estate question, they know who to call because they've already been interacting with me and they know I'm not going to pitch them. A lot of people, everybody knows a real estate agent or five. And you don't, or a hundred, you don't want the reputation of just being so on and salesy that they don't call you. So you want to create value by showing people that you are a pillar in that community and that you're driving value and collaboration and bringing people together in a meaningful way. So I really do like the Facebook groups. Um, if you're also, if you play sports, I think that's another great way. I play pickleball. Um, I have just started a pickleball, like learn to play group. And it's already grown in just two weeks. We've already got 30 members. Um, it doesn't, you know, again, it's just, I go out there and, and I'm leveraged. I'm going to be on the courts anyway. So if you can create a farm through activities that you're already doing, it doesn't have to be a like when I think of farm, I don't just think of a neighborhood. I think of it as a group of people with similar features, interests, et cetera. And that's what you're, are, you're farming it, right? You're adding water, sprinkling some, you know, fertilizer, et cetera, and hopes that it's going to grow and produce something, even if it's a referral or word of mouth, just, you know, supporting you. Yeah, I love that. Again, we had someone on Robin Mann. She talks, she's in the uh, EXP, she's out of Charlotte, but she, the the sentiment was, if you don't love lead generation, you're doing it wrong. So yep. exactly, like use what you're already doing because it's going to come across. Like don't start a gardening group if you hate gardening, but right. exactly, you're already doing these things, you know? So exactly, I also know a group of women in our group that have organizational base or, you know, someone has a you know, paddling group and someone like you said, pickleball and ice hockey. So, so you specifically, for example, so you're going to target luxury listings, but then you're also going to focus on your sphere, I guess, because you're already doing yep. ice yeah. hockey, stuff like that. Yeah. And that's where too, I think the other component of farming is your database. We always talk and hear about work your database, work your database, work your database. <laughs> It is the lowest hanging fruit, and yet I think that it is the least leveraged tool that agents use. And I don't know if it's because the technology can just be overwhelming, or if they just truly don't understand how to really work that database. So number one, if you don't have a CRM, you need one. And if you do have one, you need to use it. Every person that you encounter you need to put their information into your CRM. You need to add tags that will help you to identify a particular behavior or um, feature of that person. What I mean is I have all of the, all of the guys I've ever played hockey with are in my database and their spouses. I've got all of their kids' names. Um, if they're a football fan or if they are, you know, if they have a particular hockey team that they follow, I give them a tag for that particular sports team. And that way, when their team is playing my team, I can shoot them a quick text message. And, you know, even if it's just bullshitting, shoot it, you know, I can just say, hey, man, you know, are you watching the game tonight? You know, your team is playing my team. It has nothing to do with real estate. 
but it is a way for me to continue to stay top of mind and in front of that person. Um, tags can be used for a variety of things in your CRM. You can get really, really specific. Um, I don't recommend getting too terribly specific because sometimes too many tags almost creates analysis paralysis. So you need to have a systemic way of, a systematic way of organizing and defining your tags so that they're consistent. Um, if, for example, again, going to hockey, if I just put a tag NHL or just hockey, I'm not gonna know which sports teams are their favorite. Mm -hmm. But if I put the actual sports team in there, it's gonna help me pull a list of every time, you know, the Philip, you know, the Flyers, the Hurricanes play the Penguins, I'm gonna know which of those people I need to call. On the flip side, if you get too specific and say this is a $300,000 buyer, you're pigeonholing them into $300,000 price point. If you're trying to create a mailing piece and target buyers that are looking at $400,000 and above, you, you've eliminated them completely, not necessarily something you want to do. Um, but you definitely need a CRM. You need to get every single person in there and get it as filled out as you possibly can. Once you've got your contacts in your database, then you really need to identify what stage in their life cycle they're in. So a lot of times CRMs are looking at, you know, are they a lead? Have you had any contact with them? You know, what is their relationship to you? Um, and then where are they in the buying process? Let's say they're not buying, let's say they're not selling, but they're just somebody you know they are a prospect because they have the potential to do business with you. So you need to get your CR, not only get your contacts loaded, but you need to identify who they are to you, where they're at in their life cycle and add tags so that you can create marketing campaigns that are very targeted to that person. Okay. I feel like, yeah. So Step one, identify what you want to do, employ your, your tactics, and then, so get your contact input in your CRM. Okay, you get that done. Do you have systematic follow-up? What's your favorite method of follow-up? Like, how do you recommend they go about, okay, you're doing your active prospecting, but then here's what you need to be due to nurture. Yeah, so I have my, I have all of my contacts broken down into communication tags. So if it's somebody that's hot to trot, they are ready to pull the trigger. They're going to buy within the buy or sell within the next one, 60 days, 30 days to 60 days. They're on a completely different marketing campaign than somebody that's looking to buy or sell in the next 12 months. So I have in my CRM, I have them tagged with the communication level, A, B, or C. Um, a means that I am following up with them regularly. I do not put a timeline on that. But once a week, I'm getting a trigger saying, hey, you need to check in with them. That gives me the flexibility to check in with them by phone, text message, or email, depending on their preferred communication and depends on how I last communicated with them. So if the week before I talked to them via text message only, this week, it might be a phone call. And I'm going to look back at my notes that I took and say, okay, last week I sent them a property that I thought they might like, and I haven't heard from them. And I've reached out to them twice. I've not heard anything, but I see that they've opened it. So this time it's going to be a phone call, you know, Hey, John, I saw you looked at this property. What are you thinking? You know, what did you like? What did you not like? Where are we in this process? Um, and then based on that conversation, I'm going to, you know, he's, already set up on a marketing campaign because all of my clients or all of my contacts are on some sort of a drip campaign. He is going to be on a, you know, he's looking to buy. He is on a hot to trot buyer campaign, which means he is going to be getting emails with market um, uh, lending updates from my local lender. Um, he's getting, you know, what the new rates are. He's on a buyer search. And he's getting emails from me that have different snippets of information on what the buying process looks like. You know, hey, don't forget, here's a couple of inspectors 
when we get to that point. You know, don't forget you're going to need a septic inspection. Why is a septic inspection important? It's value add content all around the buying process. And it's not a lot. It's a piece of content once a week. So did you craft all these marketing campaigns yourself? And like, how much time did you dedicate to it? Or what are good resources for doing those? <laughs> so I am very controlling and I like to know exactly what information is going out and when. So it was, it was really a combination. One, I called my lender and asked them if they had any kind of a program, a drip campaign program um, that had content regularly. And they did. So I got permission and they send me stuff on a regular basis. And then I add it to the drip campaign that's relevant. So I'm not recreating that content. All I'm doing is copying it and putting it into my drip campaign. Mm. And then I created my own content that could, that is branded to me and can be used. There's no time limit on it. So for example, mortgage rates change all the time. So that is information that has to change all the time. But the purpose of a septic inspection, the purpose of a well inspection, that doesn't change. Who you use may change, but why you're doing it, what you're looking for doesn't necessarily change. So I added those pieces and I created, I either created that content or I went out to my vendors who provide those services and said, hey, what marketing are you doing to communicate this? And can I have it? And I would just copy and paste. And if there were holes, I created it on my own, or I went out and sourced it from the North Carolina Realtor Association or NAR or, um, you know, other industry professions um, that have information that's similar to that. And I tweaked it. So it's a combination. I spent a lot of time though on building my marketing campaigns some brokerages offer marketing campaigns, but I feel like they are very generic. And you know what? There's nothing wrong with using those, especially just to get started. At the end of the day, take a step. Just get it started. <laughs> Done is better than perfect. It's one of my favorite. Enough. Like put the, yeah, put the auto drip on and then carve out some time to work on it. That's exactly right. And that's exactly what I did. I got the auto drip turned on. And then when I had a slow season, because I feel like we all have slow seasons. When you have downtime, you set time out and you go back in and you tweak it and make it a little bit better. Um, there's nothing wrong with doing that. At the end of the day, just take the first step and do something. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, totally. Okay, well, so then, I mean, is there a next step? I feel like the next step, maybe it's subjective because obviously it depends on your feedback and whatnot. But what else are we missing in like the core package of, realtor success, you know, marketing and sales and whatnot. Yeah. Um, I think as, you know, I think as agents, your goal is focus more in the beginning on marketing and less on sales. You can't, again, marketing is building brand awareness and relationships to get you to the table. Sales is once you're at the table, closing the deal. Don't focus on the sales part because you're not even getting to the table yet, especially if you're new, you need to get yourself to the table. So you need to build brand awareness. You need to build your relationships. That area needs to be your focus. Once you get to the table, then you can either reach out to colleagues who have, you know, closed deals, who've done that and ask them to either mentor you or say, Hey, I want, you know, I want your help on this one deal. There's nothing wrong with asking for help and, you know, kind of monkey see, monkey do. What do they do? How can you mirror that and make it work for yourself? But right now is if you're a newer agent, you need to get yourself to the table and you need to get yourself to the table consistently. Getting to the table one time is awesome. Something to be celebrated. But if you're not getting to the table for another three months or six months, that's not sustainable financially. And it's something's not working then in your processes. Like you need to revisit what you're doing to build brand awareness and relationships. You need to get to the point where you are consistently getting to the table. Yeah, hundred percent. I think, especially for newer agents that hits nail on the head. Cause I have so many, they're like, well, can I come on like to a listing presentation? I'm like, sure. But do you have a listing going up? Like, and I always tell newer agents, like get a deal and we'll hold your hand the entire way. That's yep. the best way to learn like trial by fire. Yep. 
Um, but like you said, it's a funnel, it's a pipeline. Like if you don't have hundreds coming in, like you're not going to get those few that filter out into actual clients. So I think that's genius. So how, so if people approach somebody or marketing help or whatnot, like, I mean, what can they expect? Cause I feel like that's going to be everyone's question. Like, you know, coaching could be hundreds and thousands of dollars. Like what do they, what can they expect when working with somebody like you? Yeah, I mean, again, for me, I focus on their overall strategy and what they're actually trying to achieve. Again, I think a lot of people come into the market with a spray and pray method. They spray the market, pray something sticks, and I'm really going to work with them and say, what's your end game here? What are you trying to achieve? Do you want to be, you know, the expert in your community and if they're not quite sure, my goal is to help them hone in on that. You know, what does that look like? Help them to understand, you know, work about work smarter, not harder. Don't go out two hours away to sell a property that's $300,000 that's two hours away. That's not the best use of your time. Let's refocus. Let's really dive into your market, your area. Let's identify where you've got the most return on investment and where that low hanging fruit is. Um, and really dial in their goals. You know, some people are like, oh, I'm going to go out and sell 50, 50 houses today. Well, if the market doesn't support that, we need to be a little bit more realistic in setting those goals. Um, and so that's a lot. also a lot of what I do is just help people identify what their goals are and make sure that they're realistic for the market that they're in. Yeah. So what's the structure? Do you usually do like 30 minute sessions a week or, and is it, what's the pay structure? Like generally fees, what can someone expect for like a process like that? Yeah. Um, great question. So um, the structure is we can do as often or as little as you like. I tend to meet with clients at least once a week just to make sure that they are on track. Did they do their homework? Did I do my homework? What questions do they have? Because it's very easy, especially with sales agents, to get squirreled and go off in 10 different directions. So it's just that accountability. Um, the pay structure is can be structured in a couple of different ways. Um, oftentimes for clients, I do a base fee of 50 an hour. And then if they want more coaching or if they want more involvement from me to help them actually do the work, that fee structure goes up or a percentage of the commission for their first couple of, you know, first couple of deals. So it can be structured in a couple of different ways um, just to help them get off the ground. So you'll do like paid at close coaching essentially? I will. Yeah. That's, I don't think I've ever, I mean, I'm sure it exists, but I don't think I've ever heard of that. That's, yeah. that's awesome. Especially yeah. for newer agents. Um, that's, that's incredible. Yeah. But yeah. It, it helps. One, I like teaching and helping others. Um, but I also understand too, it's, you know, it's a lot of money to really truly get started as a real estate agent. And I think a lot of people don't understand coming into real estate, it can be expensive to, to get started between MLS fees, you know, your brokerage fees, you know, if you, once you do get listings, you're going to have, you know, you, you've got to have a bucket for your listing photos, your signs, all of your marketing materials, your lock boxes, et cetera. And if you're a buyer's agent, you can be running all over kingdom come spending money on gas and your time, et cetera. And you may never see a dime. So I understand it, it can be difficult to get started. Yeah, that's awesome. So anything we're forgetting, anything that stands out in your mind that you want agents in our demographic to, to know, implement? Yeah. I, mean, I think you've said a lot, so you don't have to say anything more, but I think. And I think the big thing is to try to cut through the noise and don't get sidetracked by all the shiny things. Real, you know, just like we tell clients when they're like, well, can I do this? Or I'm not going to pay for that. What do you do? You tell them, let's go back and look at the contract. What does it say in the contract that you're responsible for, that the other party's responsible for? And I would say that in your own business. If you don't have a business plan, that's where you start. So that when things do come up, those shiny objects do come up before you go forward, you say, how is this going to reach my goal? How is this going to get me new listings? that are, you know, with an average price point of 400,000 within a 30 mile radius of me. If you can't answer how that's going to happen, then don't do it. Hmm. Don't do anything, you know, like don't not do anything. You need (laughs) something, you know, but don't get distracted by all the shiny objects um, coming down the pipeline. Yeah. 
I love it. Well, I like to keep it just under an hour. So we're right on time. How can people get in touch with you? Um, easy. They can either call me, text me, or shoot me an email. Um, all three are really easy. My, do you want me to give my phone number or just, okay. My phone number is 828-230-0329. And my email address is Mary Helen, M-A-R-Y-H-E-L-E-N dot letterly. That's letter with an L-E on the end at exprealty.com. Awesome. And then also, if you're on this video or watching it, you're probably in Cheese Sparks. You, Mary is also now in the group, so you can find her on Facebook as well. But thank you so much for your time. This was incredibly awesome. helpful. And awesome. I can't wait to have you be part of our community. Awesome. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Yeah. Have a good day. Thanks. Bye.